Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 209, featuring an hour-long interview with one of the most controversial figures I've ever had on the show, namely Mr. Howard Sherman of Malinche Entertainment. Now I say controversial, uh, basically it amounts to uh, what is this guy's role in the video games industry. According to him, he is the uh, last and greatest interactive fiction publisher, very commercially successful uh, developer and producer of text adventures. Um, other people have differing opinions that we'll get into in this interview. Uh, whether you love him or hate him though, I think you'll really like this interview. It's very interesting. Anyway, I got a lot of stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Howard Sherman. Hi folks, I am here with the great Howard Sherman, the CEO and grand implementer of Malinche Entertainment. He's been in the industry for over 10 years now. He's a publisher of uh, commercial interactive fiction, a.k.a. text adventures, something I know a lot of you guys uh, love. How are you doing today, Howard? Doing great. Every day is a long day, but a great day. I was reading on your site, you describe what you do, uh, the sort of games you make is, quote, uh, quote, e-books on steroids. Right on. And I just wondered if you could sort of break that down for us, especially for somebody that has no clue what a what interactive fiction means, what text adventures are. Can you just give me a, give us an overview of what you do? Uh, definitely. Uh, e-books are very linear in that you uh, take out your, your, uh, your, your Kindle, your Nook, whatever the case might be, and you read, and then you turn a page, you, you turn a page, turn a page. In our fiction, you don't just turn a page, you talk to the story. In fact, on an iPhone, you can do it, or an Android, or a, or a Nook, as you, or anything you like, or even a Samsung tablet, and you just go to your reader, like Frotz for the iPhone, for example, and then, well, it's kind of like slow here, but the text is read. You read it like an ebook, but rather than just, you know, reading the next page, the story with the keyboard prompts you to respond to the story as you are the main character. So what happens is that you're, you're beyond just a passive activity of just, just reading what's going on here. The story part comes in when, you, when the reader uh, or the adventurer for the uh, old text, uh, text adventure game guys out there, where you actually interact and tell the story what you, as the main character, want to do next. You know, go east, pick up a sword, look at a, at a clue, examine a footprint, and so on. Yeah, I saw the ones on the PC. I was wondering uh, about the ones on uh, the other systems like the iPhone. Do you actually type in responses like go west, or is it more of like a choose-your-own-adventure type of, type of thing? Great question. Actually, it is the exact same model. Whether you're on a Mac or a PC, uh, a Kindle, an Android, not a Kindle, well, not a Kindle yet, uh, an Android, an iPhone, doesn't matter. It's it's fully interactive. It's the exact same interface where the the reader actually tells a story in plain English or abbreviations what they want to do next. But it's not like a, you know click here to go east or click here to go up the tree. It's truly interactive and fully nonlinear. You do have one for the Nook. I, I thought I saw on the website. Is that true? Yes, it is. Uh, the, the higher Nook models are based on the Android platform. So anybody running a Nook HD or HD Plus can uh, run all of my stories on their Nooks, uh, not the uh, black and white versions or the other ones there. It's got to be the ones that run under Android. That's the Nook HD and HD Plus. Well, you're, uh, you know, describe yourself as the, the last of the uh, implementers, and I assume most people probably know what that means. Like I said, people that watch this show, they're pretty savvy with computer history. They probably know about right, the work right, and, right. and everything. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, why you chose that title and, and what drew you to these, this genre. Well, it was a couple of two things. One, um, as a capitalist, I saw a good here chance to make uh, good money for a niche market that was not being served. Because uh, back in 2002, when I first cooked up this idea, I discovered Graham, you know, Graham's amazing invention of Inform, which is the, the platform to create you know, new interactive fiction. And what was out there in the, in the uh, amateur, you know, open source world were uh, titles that beyond a, a very tiny, like, sub-niche were not appealing to guys that wanted Zork or more Plentiful or Starcross or Witness or suspect other titles of Infocom, which is where the whole infant thing comes from, and to deliver titles of that flavor, a little modernized for the for the first century, and then deliver titles like that that people can enjoy that they remember. And what happened next is a whole other story. 
Well, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, dot, dot, dot. Uh, when ebooks exploded, uh, not too long after Malenche came on the market, I was at a very intriguing crossroads of the old school fans and what they wanted and what they craved more of and brand new people in the millions that were now uh, on the ebook thing, warmed up to it, ready to go, buying through the Kindle store, uh, Amazon, buying through you know, the Nook store. And the, the uh, intersection was ebooks, interactive fiction, modern technology, old school thinking, and a whole new product that most folks never heard of before. And here we are. Yeah, it's fascinating to me. I mean, obviously, like you said, we know there's people that love Zork, that love uh, Planifall, you know, Moretz right. Moretzky, all those guys. And, you know, here, here's a guy publishing new games for them. You know, you, that's a market I think everybody would see. But this idea that the sort of ebook people, people that don't play games at all, maybe these are some of the first games they've played. I mean, have you, would you say that those kind of people represent the, the bulk of the audience? Well, the, the bulk are the book people that have raised ebooks. And they, they love them and they're into them. And they're like, they see my stuff and go, what's this? They, they don't know what to make of it. They, they have no idea. So these are people who have never is. played a text adventure before. Exactly. Like, uh, uh, I'm big on book blogging. And a lot of book bloggers have no clue what I'm talking about. You know, they, they've read their entire lives since they were kids. Some are their 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, 50s, and older. And they just have no, oh, good. If you're going to drink, I'm going to drink too. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, if you or I am. Red Bull. Hey. Okay. <laughs> and they, they, they're like, what is this stuff? Now, one blogger recently, a book blogger, said, uh, she said, looks good. You're an author. I see uh, a dozen titles out there. Uh, can I try one? Sure. Send her title. What is this? How does this work? What do I do? And then, and then begins the journey discovery is, here's a fact. Here's a, a simulation you, that we created that, that you can run and kind of get familiar with not just an ebook that you read passively, but an ebook where you get involved directly. And um, they have no idea to make of it. Until, until they, 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 once they, they get it, then off they go. Yeah, I saw there were a lot of comments on the side from, from women, female gamers. I was wondering, are there lots of women that play these? I would say it's probably actually ironically about I'd say better than half are, are women. And in fact, my my research and over the years and demographic research has shown that as I write titles, and this is the biggest trick of all, and this is not a new thing, I, I didn't invent this, so I can't take credit for it, is interfection is very personal. So you can't write it like uh, anyone gender. Like, for example, you read like a, a John Sanford novel, you know, um, Lucas is the main character. He's the detective. He's a guy. He's in his 50s. He's wealthy. He's this and that. You know, I, I can't write a story that pigeonholes the reader because the reader is the main character. So I write stories that, that are gender neutral. I don't talk about, you know, for the most part, rich or poor. I put them in a regular situation and then say, oh, that, now what do you do? And that's the, the little prompt in the bottom there, the little bracket. And women have factored very heavily in this. So I've been very careful, especially in later years, to write every title with a very neutral gender, you know, non-specific medium that women and men can get involved equally, fully engaged, and not feel detached by, you know, um, I don't know, uh, here's one for you. In the first mile, and I, I'll, I'll confess to this, I goofed with the scene at the very end, I won't spoil it, and... The way I wrote one of the endings, there are many, that's one of the also, you know, the endings are many and varied. One ending would might be, well, probably, probably would be awkward for many females. And I got feedback from female readers. That was kind of weird. Please don't do that again. <laughs> you got it. Now you got and, me very uh, curious. Was, then, was it kind of a sexual uh, thing, a romantic? Um, I, I would say, like, I would say like fairy tale, bordering romantic, nothing overt, nothing, you know, nothing lascivious, nothing that would be like salacious, nothing like, oh my gosh, what is it? But definitely something a little bit beyond most folks' boundaries. 
So on that feedback, I, I made sure, and that was only the first, that was the, the yeah, one. I can, I can tell you're an interactive fiction guy because you're using words like salacious and lascivious. <laughs> 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 I, I gave it away. Oh, man, I gave it away. Well, it's true. So I, I made a point. That was the one time I goofed. It's still a great story. And actually, the first mile is my best seller ever. It's not my newest title. It was horror fiction. And uh, it's still my best seller in spite of that one little itty bitty goof that only some people even see because, again, because it's nonlinear, the story can go this way, this way, that way, that way, or no way. Um, so definitely to my female audience, I, I made sure that uh, the order of the day is this is that we will never have any gender specific roles or identities there that may make anybody feel that they're not that person or couldn't be that person. So you don't I mean, do any of those tricks like in, was it Leather Goddess of Phobos, where they they decide if thing? you're male or female, depending on which bathroom you go to? The bathroom thing, right. Uh, that was brilliant. It was a, it could, because that game kind of depends upon certain sexual connotations. So it's brilliant. And while it's a technique I might borrow in the future, I, I won't like say I'll never do that. I kind of like go from step one with this is that I don't know your gender. And I don't care. Here's a great story. Have at it. So before we get into the games uh, that you've designed, I count, let's see, at least uh, six games we can talk about here, right? Is, is that right or is there more? Oh, there's more. Over, over a dozen, actually. Over a dozen. Before we get into the actual games, I want to talk just a little bit about sort of your experience writing these things. You know, what, what, What's it like uh, to sit down to write to write one of these games? What's your process? Sort of give me the, the inside scoop of the uh, the Howard Sherman process the process starts with the cigarette <laughs> yeah exactly because you find a big bug in the game you can't find it it won't compile the game won't be completed and it's like where in the 13 or 14,000 lines of code is this bugger i i've had a story i think it was uh the safe and sin city where it was literally like i think like a letter o it was extra letter O somewhere in 14,000 lines of code. And I had to just take my, my, my down arrow and scroll, 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 eyeballing every line of code manually, like, like a manual compiler. There it is. And then compile. It's nuts. Well, I got to hear your first game. You can correct me if this is wrong, but it was like a Pintari First Light uh, 2003. That's correct fantasy game. Can you tell me a little bit about that? That's the first ever game, right? That's my first official uh, game for sale. There was or there is a Pintari prequel which like was like my like marketing intro to new interactive fiction and the Pintari prequel was a like a backstory to First Light and the prequel is totally free. Go and get it at my website, blanche.net Download it and play it. It's a fully functional game by itself. Kind of small, but very, very nice. People love it, which led the way to First Light, which was my first commercial release. Quite right. Well, what can you tell me about it? Um, well, for the old timers, the, the, the Zork fans, for example, it is as big as Zork 1, 2, and 3 combined. Wow. In one <laughs> game. Now that's really saying something there. So we're, how many hours are we talking about to complete this? I'd say if you if you didn't eat and didn't sleep and didn't go to work and took a, like a vacation you know, time for that, you could probably knock it out if you went nonstop and had some hints from me, which I do for my, all, my, all my customers. Uh, I'd say probably 50 or 60 hours because of the number of puzzles, the number of characters, the sheer expanse of the game space, how many rooms there are, the different plot twists. It, it, really, it really does take the, the reader and the adventurer in many different directions. I'm glad that you offer your buyers uh, hints and help with these games because I know a lot of times when I try to play one of these, I get stuck so bad. You know? and what, what can you do with, you know, with an adventure game? You just That's it. You know, that's pretty much the end of the road. Exactly. And you know what? If Ifocom did some research and it came to light after years that they, 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 they uh, closed down, years, years later, is that I th it's top of my head number. Better than half the people that bought their titles never finished them. 
Uh, and that's probably you know, the difference is you know, lack of time. They lose interest. They get too frustrated. They can't figure it out. They're not sure what's going on next. Uh, they, you can buy, uh, you know, this includes like 10 bucks a book. <laughs> I remember that. And, uh, <laughs> right, right. And uh, in later days, but Activision in, in Return to Zork, their first like, you know, gooey version of Zork, you know, back, it, 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 I'm going right back here. Like really, Activision, Infocom, what is it? What, what's a GUI? Yeah, I, just, I just talked to Bill Volk, you know, who was on the Return to Zork uh, team. I think he might have been one of the, maybe he was the lead designer. I don't know. I, I have no idea. And they actually had, in fact, in, in one of my, because I'm also a geek collector like you are, I see the back of their ribbon and I see the desktops. So in my collection, my home, like little income museum, is a copy of Return to Zork. And in there is a little card where you can you know, call it a 900 number for pay with a minute and hints. And I'm like, man, that's just not cool. So one of my marketing promos was hints are free, no books, no pay per minute access, just email me. It might not be the same day at the same hour, but I'll get back to you directly because I want the kind of personality. I, I want to hear what people like, what they don't like, where they're stumped, where they're stuck, which puzzle is, is like beyond comprehension. In fact, in a free game called This Tech I Wrote, I say just about everybody gets stuck in the Jaguar room. And if you want to go download Azteca and then go play it a while, they'll, they'll see very shortly about the, the Jaguar room and how folks get stuck there. Despite the fact I leave a blatant hint in the room description and I make it, I give the, the reader any one of, I would say at least two or three different ways to kind of crack the code of that room. And I would say four to five just get stuck. They can't do it. And uh, I'm like, aha, okay, so blatant him, you know, lots of, you know, trails, but they can't get it. So that kind of feedback, one-on-one from them to me, helps me get better at making puzzles that are not, like, ridiculous. Although I think the Jaguar room it makes a lot of sense to me, but that, that's my head. And make a puzzle that is more meaningful, more satisfying when solved, and that, and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's got to provide you with amazing insight into your own games and how people play i'm just kind of wondering as as this is sort of you've gone through this process what have you learned about putting hints just enough of a hint where it's not just giving it away you know how do you walk that line well when i played zork zero i, I like the in-game hints they provided there and in fact in my in my latest titles last two or three of them i do provide in-game hints where you're like it's two o'clock in the morning you're you're you're, you're so burned out you're frustrated and you type in the word hint, and depending upon where you are, it gives you a, a hint for that area, that puzzle, that that air, that room you're in, and it gives you a bit of a nudge forward because you just never know. But the bigger thing is, is that it's it's a breaking point where where do you induce madness on the part of the reader and what they can't solve, and where do I? And I think Mark Blank said this, where we're like almost like, um sadistic with how we invent a puzzle that that while it makes intrinsic sense at one level the reader just can't get it and no fault of theirs it's just like you know it's like Indiana Jones and it will be you want to you want to watch it's like when you see the, the the movie playing out and the puzzle the trap the, the the hidden thing in the tomb comes out then they go oh man that makes total sense now to think about it and that's I want that moment but I, I'd rather have them get it on their own but I'm have satisfied if I give it to them and they go, wow, that is cool. Yeah, I should have gotten that, that kind of thing. So what's your latest game project? I see I was reading something about one called The Barista. It's about a CIA, field, op CIA uh, field operator. Yeah, The Barista. Yeah, what can you tell me about that one? Uh, that, that one is one of, it's a labor of love and a passion of mine. Uh, a lot of my own feelings will come out, will come out in that story. I got so sidetracked by 20 other things, and I'm, I'm like a typical author, like, you know, you, you go on Facebook or Twitter, and there's all kinds of, like, different, like, you know, write, whoosh, or uh, a flamethrower, like, write, write, you know, uh, write 10 pages or die, and uh, I'm, I'm there now. I have so many things going on in, in business and personal life, all of them good, by the way, thank God, but um, the barista is one for the heart, where I'm tying in, I won't spoil it, I, won't, I almost spoiled it where I'm tying in a very real world, modern day social issue that affects everybody of every stratosphere, every strata, every social class, every country with the very feelings of a person 
that's in turmoil between their personal and professional lives. And it's one from the heart. And while I have a lot of notes written down and I do something every day to move things forward, I'm behind on it like usual. But the barista is one that I think that almost anybody will find very satisfying um, topically from the plot standpoint and also personally from how I would say that most folks can relate to what's in the story. Yeah, I was reading your development blog on that game, and I you know, have to recommend this blog to everyone. Even if you don't really care for the games, I think they would really get interested in your sort of personal story and these things that you're putting into this blog. Sort of wondering, uh, you know, to what extent you think your personal life carries over into your games. Oh, they do. Every writer has inspirations. You know, um, Orson Scott Card wrote about inspiration coming from the checkout line of the supermarket. You know, it's like we can't write in a bubble or a vacuum. We, we have to write from what we know, what we feel, what we experience, where we've been, who we are, and what we see. And those things carry over to our writing because it's inevitable. In fact, Stephen King himself, to write a lot, read a lot. Why? Because you can't be in a little bubble of, 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 of a vacuum and say, I'm going to write today about, you know, uh, Aruba. I'm write today about, you know, my, my times in Russia in like, uh, you know, Pitch St. Petersburg. You have to have exposure to feelings, thoughts, ideas, experiences that kind of move you forward and push you to say, wow, I want to do that. All right, so we talked about Pintari. Uh, what about Greystones, the 2003 murder mystery? Oh, my gosh. Okay, <laughs> first, let me explain. Did you say that with or with, with dread? Yeah. No, it was a great story, and that was probably my own adventure personally to writing it. Um, there is a disclaimer in red on the bottom of the screen. If you, if you scroll down to the bottom of the Greystone page on Melanchay.net and look at Mystery Then Greystone, there is a little disclaimer in red there at the very, very bottom. Uh, that was at the behest of the Attorney General of New Jersey. That was fun. Who was very unhappy with my decision to write about a, a real functional Second Hospital of New Jersey that was a, you know, that I was on the grounds of researching and I actually got access behind the scenes from a worker there who I will never name, not even their gender, uh, because I don't want that person to have any kind of, even 10 years later, to be persecuted, prosecuted, terminated, whatever it might be. Uh, I saw things in Greystone that no one has seen in decades. And after I did a lot of research, uh, on the grounds, on the property, it, it, was, it, it was massive before they broke it up and just, you know, remodeled it. And um, part of the research involved actual patient records that ended up on the Internet. I'm talking pictures, names, file numbers, uh, case histories. I didn't take them. I didn't scan them. I didn't. I found them Googling or Yahooing or 10 years ago Googling. I don't, I'm an old man and here. So it was, it was down to, I got a, uh, a UPS overnight letter from the Attorney General of New Jersey. Uh, my egregious acts of violating patient rights. I said, hold, 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 time, time out, hold on, hold on. Now that wasn't me. Uh, here's this URL. Here's this website. Here's where I got it from. Go yell at them. I just did my research as a writer, and here's what I found. Even so, the Attorney General decided to give me a break, God bless him, at the time, two years ago, and said, the disclaimer goes on all gross material. Uh, and that's how I got off the hook of having a huge legal mess uh, dispersed with one line of red on the page. And it, it, it's a great piece. I, a Greystone, I, I think I blogged about it at some point where I was in a, I was in a, at, a, at a doctor's office going through New Jersey Magazine, and I'm going through Greystone. The picture alone, the main building, I was like frozen, like, I got to write about this. This is too cool. And I did. And when, when word got out, my I got some pickup. I, I got an employee on the inside who got me into all the buildings that were safe to go into. And uh, great, 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 great story. And the mystery is amazing, uh, not only because it's, it's kind of one part spooky, one part mysterious, one part who done it, it's one part also very human because there's an the element there of humanity to the mentally ill 
and that their problems are really not their fault. They are, they're victims of, uh, of many different elements that made their problems come about to no fault of their own. So I do bring about humanity in, 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 in that piece as well because I, I didn't want to like a stereotype of you know crazy people or the mentally deficient. I wanted to show people that they're people too with rights and feelings, and as much as they're not maybe of the same weight that we're on, there's still people too and fully deserve our respect. And that, and, that, and that deserving respect is what made me write Greystone the way I did. And I'm, I'm proud of it. And still a little scared of the Attorney General. All right, so that was Greystone. So it sounds like you're not the kind of guy, the kind of game developer that just sits in an office all day looking at lines of code. I mean, you're out in these places doing field research, really. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think I have to. I mean, part of my philosophy is immersion, where the reader is not just getting my, my take on interpretation. It's like I went there, I saw this, I felt this, and here's my writing of what I felt, saw, and experienced. Because that makes it different, because a lot of writers do that. Stephen King did, does it a lot. A lot of writers get out there. They talk to detectives, they talk to police, they talk to common, you know, the common folk out there that, that are around the, the little nexus of their plot. And I'm the same way, because in my opinion, if I can't produce, I mean, realism from firsthand experience that's primary, where my eyes saw it, here's how I felt, like going to Las Vegas and Cincinnati, City, being in Russia in, in, in St. Petersburg, you know, going to Aruba, you know, and being there, my whole goal is to deliver that being there experience to readers and, and gamers, you know, that you are there. It's a blast. What about in-game, a 2004 suspense? Oh, well, um, kind of like Greystone, I can't exactly talk about all of that. Uh, that's classified. Um, I will say this. Uh, I did do a lot of research aboard naval ships. I can't name them. Well, I can't name them. Some Tom Clancy leg <laughs> guy here. <laughs> well, I won't go that far, but there are reasons, uh, legal and security reasons, where I can't name the ships. But I did go on naval vessels. I did do in in intensive research on onto design, uh, weapon systems. And I'm ex-military myself from like the 80s, so I was ex-Army, a National Guard, so I wasn't a Navy guy. But a lot of mentality of the military in general does bleed through to all the different branches. So I, I did draw upon some experiences there, as well as a lot of technology and ship design and actual naval ships um, that led me to write a story that makes a lot of sense, blended with a modern-day issue with Iran and North Korea Although the story is not that new anymore, the plot is still playing out in the world stage. And Endgame is a game that definitely, uh, I think that anybody that likes techno thrillers or suspense thrillers will find very, very satisfying. You sort of mentioned politics again there. I'm sort of wondering, is part of the goal of your games to get people to think about these real life political issues? Or are you sort of neutral as far as that kind of thing is concerned? Um, I'm no Iron Rand. But I will say that I do kind of blend in some moral fabric in my stories and that I want people to think, uh, not in one given philosophy or one given ide ideology, but more a matter of just looking at a scenario like North Korea. Uh, what they're doing and what they've been doing is ridiculous. Ditto Iran. Uh, that part of the world or any part of the world can't live under a constant black cloud of fear and intimidation. And if I don't get this, I'll build this nuke. And if I'm going to nuke this, I'm going to make a rocket that can reach the West Coast of America. You know, it, it's, it's, it's beyond Democrat, Republican, Independent, you know, um, Libertarian. It's more a matter of what does common sense say? Can a, can a nation of that type with that kind of ideology um, have a weapon that powerful and then drop that bomb or rocket where they please? The answer is no, no matter who you are. So I try to leave out politics and try to bring in more blend of humanity and, and common sense, just pure common sense. What makes sense here? What should it be? What shouldn't be? What should be stopped? And what should be promoted? Well, moving on then to the first mile, 
You said, um, that, was, I think you said that was your okay. favorite game, right? 2005? It's like children. I, I had no favorite children. Every every book, I, I love them all equally. I mean, uh, I can't pick, like, this is my favorite book I ever wrote. Uh, I, I love them all. Well, what, like, somebody just says, I, I just want, just tell me which of, the, which of the games I should try first. You know, let's, let's put it that way. Uh, here's my question to you. What do you like? I like the sound of the first mile, you know, to me. You, you like horror? Yeah, sure. It's good. Well, look, you're going to love it. Especially in a text adventure game where, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it just well, seems like well, Grand the, perfect, Dam, the perfect genre for that. Uh, I, I agree totally. Uh, Grand Dam, my, my last horror title, came out just a few months ago, is also excellent and um, definitely worthy. I mean, they're both great horror titles. They're, they're, there's nothing there leaving anybody high and dry. There's plenty of uh, fear factor in either one of them. Um, I'd say if you like horror, I'll, I'll say The First Mile or, or Grand Dam or maybe both because they're, they're both horror novels Different venues, different ambiance, different 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 back set, uh, but both very very scary, and at the end very very cool. So, do you creep yourself out when you're writing these? No. Oh, looking over your shoulder as you're coding. I mean, <laughs> well, I I would say no, but it's like I I know my own boundaries, and they're rather timid for a horror for a horror writer because. One is, um, I don't like totally grotesque, like body parts and intestines and things. That's like, it's got its place, I think. I think the shock value has a value, but uh, I'm not going to write about totally, totally out there beyond all comprehension. People are screaming from the keyboards, ah, I don't believe you wrote that. You know, I don't want, I don't want that, but um, sometimes I do scare myself. And one of my testers, uh, Stuart, uh, in the first mile, of course, he said, dude, that is totally grotesque. How did you write that from here and here? You know, and that was it, you know, from the heart and the mind. But never do I want a title so scary that I would read it myself. So that's kind of like my litmus test. Would I read this or would I, would I put it down? So the shock value stops at just so far. The, the fear factor is there. But I would say in a more of a, of a classic way where I, I put some gore out there. And it's yeah, gratuitous sometimes, but mostly it's it belongs. It's like a chef putting in too much salt. It's like if I put in too much salt, it tastes good, but it's too salty. I don't want my my work to be like that. Well, we're talking about you know the sort of violence and gore in some of the games. I'm wondering where would you you know if you had to give it a rating like a movie has an R rating, PG thirteen, whatever. Where would you put these games? Are there some that are more you know adult oriented than other ones? Funny enough, a lot of people, not a lot, a few people have asked me to rate my titles. I said, no. Do you find ratings in books? I'm not, rating my, I'm not going to rate my titles. Because, good, but you never know what you're getting with a novel, right? It could be... Exactly. <laughs> like George R. R. Martin, you know. <laughs> Holy exactly. cow. <laughs> like, like Stephen King in, in, in The Stand. Great, great novel, by the way. There were two editions. I read the first version of The Stand, and I liked it a lot. Great story. Amazing. Also, a big book. But in the later edition, which is called his preferred edition, there were scenes in there that, that offended me. And I will tell you the truth. I, 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 I had not. I actually, for I'd say a decade, said, I'm dumb Stephen King. Thank you. I'm out of here. Bye bye. And uh, he kind of he kind of you know, curved it in. I came back to his titles and, and got back to me a little bit, a little bit there because you don't want to shock the readers at the point of no return. You don't want to offend the point is. This guy's a lunatic. This is, I paid money for this. This, this is, well, I, they, they, they're like bubbling. They're babbling because they, they're, they're in shock. I, I want to move the reader. I want to give the gamer a great experience, but I don't want to blow their minds to the point of no return where they're like, you know, either I'm out of my mind or I, I offended somebody here. So that's why I'll, I'll go right to the edge of what I know societally is acceptable and stop right there. But I won't cross the line. Also, my own taste. I, I can't tastefully write a story that goes too far in one given direction, either sexual or or, uh, or horror, that or, or any kind of violent attitude where we go so far off the fringe end that we're like, my God, this guy's out there. I'm done. So it's like it's a fine line. It's, it's really it's a balance that never ends. Well, you have some some kids, right? Uh, one so far, and one in the plenty phases. So are you letting them play your games, or are you just there 
Are they too well, young? She, my, my daughter's seven. She's oh, quite yeah, the first reader. Might might be old enough to, to get into it. Huh? Yeah, like I, I put her in first light. It's it's a fun game, very very light. I mean, like kids played Zork. I mean, I have no problem with kids playing any Atari game, either First Light, The Apprentice, you know, Second Dawn. Fine. The crime novels probably just beyond their the level. Uh, ditto suspense because it's like, why is your man kidnapping that person, and where is this man? Who's the mob? What's the mafia? So it's like I think the Atari series for for any age at all. The other ones, um, well, I don't use too much language in any any one novel. If it makes sense, I put it in. But Pantari, I think, is, uh, I would call it G boring on PG rated because of not just, you know, the lack of, of any adult language or foul language, but that kids can get it and enjoy it and uh, get into the whole fantasy thing. What about Saints in Sin City? Well, kids can't go on casino floors, and uh, they shouldn't go in my... Well, it's not bad. Um, it's very adult oriented, but not because of like gratuitous sex. Sorry, there isn't any. But I kind of flirt a bit. The, 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 the reader has some fun or could have some ideas. Uh, there's gambling. There's liquor. There's there's uh, intrigue. There's spies. It, it, I mean, it's it's a great great story. But for kids, they wouldn't get it. You know, not because of s words and, and f words and f bombs. It's more a matter of they wouldn't appreciate what's happening and why. It's 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 a world stage of intrigue, spying, uh, terrorism plays into it, and my daughter wouldn't know where to begin. She's only seven. She's a smart girl, but she's not there yet. Well, I was looking on the you know you've got some Wikipedia pages obviously about the company and, and <coughs> they mentioned this uh, quote unquote controversy, you know about oh, the company that. and. I'm just wondering, is this just some sort of crank that's put this stuff up there, or are there people out there that actually do some are for some reason offended by you? I, I don't know. It, it's been years. I mean, that the Wikipedia page has been, has been out of date for years. Uh, I didn't create it. I don't maintain it. I, I have no idea. I think the controversy, as as I understand it, may may stem from some people not not being pleased with my my take on interactive fiction. That they may be offended by my commercialism or how my philosophy of design is not the same as theirs, uh, that I had a lot of bravado or ego, as they put it. But, you know, beyond that, I couldn't say. I mean, it's, it's been all quiet, which run for years. But I think the controversy stemmed from uh, people in the community that push amateur interdiction not agreeing with me and me not with them. And I think it's kind of like a... Uh, it's been some years since anything came out of those quarters, so I, I would call it a, a very uneasy piece, kind of like the Korean thing. We're, we're, <laughs> we're at war, but we're, we're not at war. It's like there are troops on both sides of the border, but everything's kind of cool, mostly cool. Oh, let's see, what was it going to – I was going to follow up with that. Oh, I, I remember now. So you think the controversy is just the fact that you're making money with your games and there's thirty in this free model? I, I don't think that's entirely it. I mean, other guys who tried and and, and uh, didn't break through like I did. Um, I think it's more a matter of, and this is my interpretation. I, I may be wrong, but I think it's a matter of philosophy, design philosophy. That uh, as writers go, they're better than I am, and I'm uh, and I, and from their view, I'm better than they are. Um, I look at it as what do people want. You know, uh, and, and my view is this, you know, going again 10 years later, looking at the scoreboard 10 years on, is the community of, of, of amateur internet fiction fans and, and authors and whatnot has not grown. In fact, I think it might have shrunk, but I couldn't be sure about that. Uh, but it definitely, it didn't blossom. There's no explosion of popularity. So if you look at, at the scoreboard 10 years later, what they're offering isn't being embraced by the masses where my work is picked up on, on all the major reading channels and uh, Goodreads and on Amazon. And, you know, it's like, I'm there, they're not. Uh, am I saying that, you know, I'm great, they're not? No, but we have to look at the metrics. And as a, as a business guy, capitalist, you know, pig that I am, <laughs> metrics are who's reading, who's buying, who's rejecting. And if their stuff was as good as they, as they claim it to be, why aren't they doubling size and community every three, four years? Why aren't they not like now thousands, thousands of fans doing this? They're, they're not, you know, and did they fail? 
No. They're, did they succeed? I don't think so. Um, it's a matter of, and, and again, 10 years older with gray hair now in my head, a little more mature, is I'm willing to accept the fact that we have a difference of opinion and leave it at that without any more flame wars and hating and because it, it got ugly for a while. And uh, I, I just went back in the whole thing. So it, really, it really got ugly. <laughs> I just, try, I just try to imagine this, like people really getting this worked up over, you know. Oh, oh they, they, yeah, did, it's, it's they amazing. did, and I did. I, I was at, I was at Gen Con. You can go on one of the groups and, and Google back to one of the groups in, in our fiction. I was in my, my suite at the hotel, the Double Tree, and I had like my laptop. A, a heat up dinner and a bottle of something. And it's like, it's like, you bastard. And you know, it's like, it was back and forth. And it was like 20 on one, 20 of them, one on me. And I was just, I was just whipping their butts all the way around. And it was just, it was vicious. It was just, and I was like, why am I doing this? Why are they doing this? What are we doing here? And, you know, years later, again, Gray hair helped me out a little bit here. Is like you know they go their way, I'll go my way, and uh, they do their thing, I'll do my thing, and then let's just let's just like you know North Korea, South Korea, let's just keep the banner right here, and nobody shoot any guns, and we'll just, we'll be just fine. So you actually got death threats over this? No, 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 no death threats. <laughs> I'm sorry if you got that impression. No death threats, no actual physical violence. Just that the the online postings and the and the and the blog postings, it it got at times vicious. Uh, some people on my side, some against, some against me, some for me, and the whole thing became a gigantic waste of time because I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, change their hearts and minds. They're not going to suddenly go, oh, you know, he is right. I'm going to buy all his titles now. It's like they couldn't win. I couldn't win. It's a zero sum game. I mean, very seldom in life to see a zero sum game. That whole thing was a zero sum game, and I said, no, nah, I'm done. And well, I basically, think basically what they were trying to publish their games commercially as well and they just didn't pan out for them or were they well, well a, a couple did i think as a community there was a general sense of uh, a, a general vitriol against me uh not because they failed and I succeeded or not because i'm good and they're bad or uh, they're good and i'm bad it's more a matter of uh independently of the few guys that try to make go at it and didn't make it uh them aside is as a community I think that, that our philosophies are just too different to be compatible. That's probably the best way to summarize it. Well, have you, have you played some of these games? I was looking for some of the, some of the names of the you know, IF community, people like uh, Emily Short, Andrew Plotkin. Right. Are, are these names familiar to you? Probably, right? Graham Nelson. Have, have you played Never these? Heard. Never heard of them? Hey, nobody, who are those people? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll tell you a true story. Uh, even I've heard it. I'm not. A, I'm not the hugest. I don't really keep up with this scene. You know, I have to admit. But he, you know, even I've heard some of these names before. No, I, right. As have we all. Um, Emily Short. I actually happen to like a lot. Um, I, I don't love her work, but I think she's awesome. And uh, I will never say why beyond we have chatted offline unofficially, and she's awesome. And. I'm not like her biggest fan in the world, but I think she's awesome. Andrew Plotkin, I'll be very, very diplomatic and, and, and have a neutral view of him. Uh, a lot of talent, um, a lot of things that are not so positive, but uh, on balance, um, he he's okay. I'll, I'll say that. And Graham Nelson, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy because Graham <laughs> Nelson is impossible. I mean, Graham Nelson is the man. Without him, uh, the arena Malenche. In fact, my discovery of, of Inform, his platform, which he basically versioned from Impacom, the brilliance of his design, the energy he put in it, his dedication to the whole idea, and, and what he's done over the years, I mean, he's the man. All rise. Okay. <laughs> no, seriously, that, that, that's what Grim Nelson is. Are there, are there other authors out there that you admire? And are still doing stuff, I should say. I mean, oh. <laughs> I mean obviously, we, we all love the, the old old guys, but, you know. Now, other than that, I would say, well, Mark Lang, Steve Moretzky. Uh, oh, of course. Right, right. Uh, the modern guys, 
Uh, and I, again, I'm not making a, I'm not taking a swipe here. I'm not, be, I'm not taking a, a backhanded view of this thing here. Uh, quite frankly, um, there's nobody's work today. I can say like, is like overwhelms me. I'm, I'm not like waiting for the next title on that. I don't have a Google alert on their next work. Um, in fact, that's why Melanchia was born. Melanchia was born of that absence of titles that people really want and did pay for with my theory two years ago. They bought them again, and they did. And that expanded to the general reading community beyond, you know, th th those guys. But no, there's no author that bowls me over. I'm not waiting on bated breath. I'm not on the waiting list to turn the next title. Um, I, I, and in fact, to be quite frank, I've been unplugged from them, that community, for probably, I'd say, four going on five years, where I, I, I don't even know who's writing anymore. I don't know what's out there. I, I literally, I swear to God, I have no idea what's going on anymore. What you, those ever, you keep up with that contest? The, was it the IF competition or something like that? The... No, I, I'd say same thing, ditto. Have you ever entered it, entered that? Oh, yeah. I got like Did a you win? <laughs> place in 35, I think. Wow. Well, I, I, yeah, it was a title called BOFH, which uh, I, I kind of co-wrote with Summer Travaglia, who is the uh, the original B O F H, which is bastard up in from hell, and it, it was a, it, it was a funny story. It was an honor to co-write with him. Uh, actually, I, I wrote it. I implemented all the code, but he gave me lots of great jokes, like the uh, X Y Z Z Y joke in the game that he wrote the response to. I just put it in there, um, and it is hysterical, by the way. I won't give it away, but just download it. Get free game, no charge at all. B O F H. It is hysterically funny, and I had a great time writing it with him. But uh, now here's the my bizarre world interpretation. In in the gaming contest, it scored like uh, if not not I don't think it was last, but damn near last. But the world loved the game. Google the term, go on down, downloads down, you know, seen it .com. It got great reviews, three stars, four stars, five stars. Hysterical. I couldn't get the cattle prod joke. I didn't know what to do in Las Vegas. Again, Vegas. I love Vegas. And uh, it was a great title, just not for them. And I think that was my first kernel of understanding is that we're just not compatible. You know, what I write is not what they want. What they write is not what I want. And other people don't want. And uh, like the whole book world. I mean, people write, there are thousands of books put every year. Not every reader buys every book. They can't because, you know, you can't read all this in, in one year. So everybody has their flavor and their taste. They got theirs. I have my take. They have their take. And uh, there we go. So B of H was a hit, but not with them. Yeah, it almost sounds like you're sort of the equivalent of a Stephen King writing, you know, stuff that a lot, a lot of people enjoy. And whereas they're more sort of the high uh, liter literary, I guess you'd call them, uh, somebody like Jonathan Franzen, for example. You think that's a, a fair analogy? Um, I'm going to say no. Because if I agree with you, I get flames about. <laughs> he thinks he's Stephen King. He's, no, I'm serious. Well, I just, you know, I just threw that name out he there. You know? this way. <laughs> he thinks he's Stephen King. He thinks as good as he's none of his book. So if, if I agree with you, I'm going to get flame tomorrow. So. <laughs> think let's, let's, okay, not Stephen King. Some you know, relatively obscure but okay. moderately commercially successful author. Let's say. Point taken. Like, okay. Uh, disclaimer first. I don't think I'm as good as Sean Patterson, Stephen King. Okay. Um, I do write for the mass market. Um, I, I don't write like, you know, paint by numbers where I just fill in the, the lines here and here's my formula. And if I mix in my, my flour, my eggs, my sugar, I'm going to have a cake. Um, I, I, I go off the page a bit. But, yeah, I do write what sells. I do write things that people I feel want to read. And – uh, somewhere on in one of my inbox subfolders is I think one of the best ones I ever got, where uh, a fan told me that actually he summarized what you just said that their style, their writing philosophy is geared towards a very small audience of people that have that mindset. Not good, not bad, not right, not wrong. It's what they feel, how they feel. And my philosophy is what would be a really cool story that people would enjoy. Um, and if it's, again, I'll, I'll get flamed for that too. He thinks right things that we don't want. It's like, I'm telling you, dude, this is what happened five years ago, six years ago. 
He said every interview was like, I was flamed by this. You either love it or hate me. Um, it's just different philosophy. And, you know, again, my, the gray-haired man, and you know, that I am now, a little over here, doesn't want to look at it as though I'm better, they're better, they're wrong, I'm right, uh, I rock, they suck. Uh, not true, not true. He said we suck. Oh, damn it, I'm going to get him now. That, that, that was them. And it's like, no matter what I say, there's no right answer. They will spin anything. Uh, so just like I think your summary is, is very, very on, on, on the mark. Uh, the writing's good, the quality's there, but it's just a matter of who are you trying to reach. Their audience reach is different than my reach. And I think that's part of the whole, you know, armistice thing that's going on here. You know, at least from my point of view, we'll agree, disagree. You got your view, I got my view. Uh, I'm not wrong, you're not right, and I don't suck and you don't rock. And, you know, let's, let's just stay friends, okay? Peace. Time out. Well, let's uh, move on a little bit from that. As, you know, as fascinating as it is, I, I wanted to get your take on graphical adventure games. And just which one? Graphical adventure games in general. Uh, do you just not play those? You're not interested in those? Or? No, uh, no, th th they're fun. In fact, I, I I actually signed up for Aldo's Kickstarter campaign to fire up you know the, the new you know adventure game. It's awesome. I didn't get my copy yet. I don't know where they are with that, but um. I enjoyed them. I, I played a lot of Al Lowe's games. Lucy Larry was an awesome series. I, I still want to get my copy of the new one that just came out recently. I, in fact, I'll make a note to do that tomorrow because I paid bucks for my premium level there. Um, and it works. I, I played a lot of them. I, I enjoyed them. I don't play them today. I played Ultimate Line until about two years ago. Um, it's got a place. I like them. You know, they're, they're fun. But these days, I'm way more into books. But I still play games, new graphics. Well, let's see. If somebody wants to... Uh, actually, I'm going to hold that question for a minute. I got two questions here from viewers uh, okay. that they sent in. So right on. Take the, so here's one from David Palmer. He says, which themes, mechanics, or ideas originating with text adventure games do you see in contemporary games? And which ones do you wish that you saw more of? That's a great question. And I don't play many games today that you call contemporary. But uh, I will borrow on the model from Nintendo. Because ha we have a DS, which I did put games on too, by the way. Uh, plug, plug, plug. Um, it's very satisfying that the game has a positive atmosphere or at least, well, things aren't great, but you can make them better. And that, that mechanic works for me a lot. You know, where, you know, not that things are too dark, too serious, too, too sinister, where the player is like, you're going into the game totally uh, screwed, and it gets worse from there. And that's, that's not fun for me. Remember, here's your challenge. Here's what you can do. Go out and do it. And so that, that mechanic, I think, is timeless. And Nintendo has done that a thousand times over from 30 years ago to today, and it still works. It's like that mechanic of put the player in the position of making a good difference. I think that plays out today very well, too, except that some games, and I don't, I don't play much. I don't own an Xbox. I don't own a, a, a PS3. He's behind the times here. Okay. okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Okay, I'm done with that. Okay. And so I don't have that perspective modern times. I, I read books a lot more. I mean, I have, I have audio books, I have e-books, I have print books, and I'm just reading books. I'm, I'm a book geek. But I do play games, and I, I like that mechanic that Nintendo puts out. That's the way to go, I think. Alright, so here's one from Anatoly Shashkin, or Shashkin, not sure, hope I don't get the name. <laughs> hope it's one of those. It says, uh, what happened to that adventure game convention you were going to organize? It's, it, you know, funny enough, just yesterday, I blogged about it because yesterday was the birthday of Randy Siglansky. Uh, you, are you aware of Randy's work? Uh, you know, the name is familiar. What, what did he do? Uh, he founded one of the biggest sites for adventure gamers on the Internet, uh, Adventure Gamer, uh, JustAdventure.com. Okay, yeah, that's where I've seen the name. Though. And uh, in fact, I blogged about it yesterday. So, guys, go to Malintry.net and then click on blog. In fact, yesterday I wrote like a nice long piece for Randy in his honor, 
And I talk about the convention. I talk about, you know, what went wrong, what went right. Um, in fact, uh, if Anthony wants, I'll email him the archived web pages uh, and give him the history that was written. In fact, I think the Wayback Machine could do it for you. But I will tell you this. Uh, it was a complete disaster from day one. Uh, I got the right venue and I got all the right people. They all came up. They all had, it was, it was awesome. Hi, Alex Howard. How are you? Hello. Or Steve Bretzky. I'm talking to all these rock stars. Yeah. Oh, I'm not worthy. Oh, I'm not worthy. And it was, it was awesome, but it came down to price that these people, Al Lowe, Steve Bretzky, um, gosh, uh, the list is out there in the blog. In fact, uh, I mean, dozen, a dozen people, all of the rock stars in their own right would not come to a holiday inn in the middle of Pennsylvania and eat Burger King and hang out and, and leave. They, they wanted a venue. They wanted quality. They wanted uh, quite rightly, in my opinion, they wanted a spotlight to be, to be shined on them, uh, which they deserved. And the venue couldn't be some cheap, low grade, sloppily run thing where you pay your 20 bucks and get in and you get their autograph and leave. That, that wasn't going to fly. The airfare for all the different celebrities, they, they wanted hotel suites, a lot of them. I won't name names. They, they, wanted, they, wanted, I, they, they wanted stuff. And that was not possible on a, a low-frame budget where, you know, well, okay, here's your two-room suite, the Holiday Inn Jacuzzi in the yeah, bathtub. They think, they think you're Activision or something? What, what the heck? Well, exactly. And then it came down to is, well, Howard, you fund it. Well, okay. I'll take out my two hundred thousand dollars or hundred thousand in my pocket, and I'll just count the thousand dollar bills. And uh, if I want to gamble in Vegas, because the first venue was going to be in Vegas at, at the Mirage Hotel, it's like they wanted money because you got to feed people, you got to put out lunch for them, you got to put out dinner, you got to put up breakfast, you got to feed your people, you got to fly everybody in, air tickets for for twenty five people. I mean, the math didn't work, and we sold some tickets. We gave out everybody got a full refund because. We couldn't sustain it on what they wanted to pay compared to what the state would cost. It just it just wouldn't fly. You know, in fact, no, I won't name names. No. No, not doing it. But I wish it worked, though. I really, it would have been awesome. But it, it just was not the big. Actually, I wanted to ask you, too. I didn't have this written down, but I'm kind of curious how you came sure. up with the name of your company, Malinche. Do you want the boring story or the true story? I'm sorry. You want the true? You want the, the boring true story or the exciting story? It's that it's an unusual sounding name. You know, it's got to mean something. Okay. Yeah, yes, it does. It means two things. Uh, it's a volcano in, in Mexico, and the whole idea is that while it doesn't erupt often, when it does, it changes the world around it. <sighs> there you go. <laughs> is that the true story or the boring story? <laughs> All right, so I know that you said on the website at least that people have sent approached you or maybe sent, maybe they've actually submitted games before that they wanted you to yes. publish. Uh, just wondering what, you know, sort of how, to, what, obviously they, you don't want to just people just to s submit you stuff at random, but no. you know, what if somebody out there has some talent and they, they want to uh, publish, they sort of want to make some money with their interactive fiction. I mean, what, what, what kind of advice do you have for them? Don't. <laughs> don't no, seriously. Don't. Um, and this, uh, I'm going to take here a, a serious side in this interview. Uh, the first ever approach I got for for a new game idea came from a woman uh, in New Jersey um, that had and it, this 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 is said. There's no other way to put this. She had a great game idea. Um, she had a, a, a plot outline. She had a story. She had beginning, middle, end. It was a story, story, but couldn't code. She couldn't write the actual code to make this thing compile. And I mean, this is back in my early days um, when I already had like 10 ideas in my own head already and a whole queue of games going up and a whole schedule going. And um, I, I refused politely. And I, I had to make a mental note to never, ever use anything like what she thought of because of legal issues where, you know, I, I told about that story five years ago and he made this game, which is just like that. And I'm going to sue his ass. 
So every time I get a submission idea, I, it goes a list of things not to write about. It's legally, if I get a submission and I, and I have this thought in my head about game X five years later, they're going to think that it's their idea and they, I owe them money. So legally speaking, I don't want that nightmare because then, in fact, I was told by my attorneys to discard anything that was submitted unsolicited. This way, you know, and I don't even open it. I don't delete out garbage can. So this poor woman, I rejected her work. I rejected her proposal. Not her work. It was a great story. I liked the idea. Um, it, it was very deep. And I would have liked doing it. But I couldn't collaborate with her because she didn't have even like a book. She had an idea. And like taking her idea, you know, beginning, middle, end, just a rough outline and making it into a book based on that would be a drain of my time, exhaust her to no end, and we all get frustrated. Um, and it, it didn't go well. She was, she didn't take news very well at all. It ended up being a very sad event. And uh, one one gentleman, great guy, had an idea for a, high, for a new Harry Potter game. That's great. First call per lawyers, get the approvals, get the sign, get 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 the sign off, and then let me know. No, no problem there. Yeah, right. No, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's, he called, talk to the Queen of England. He's, he's your time doing that. No, it, it's true. I mean, people approach me, and I'm always very nice about it. I because I, I encourage creativity. I don't want to squash anybody's feelings. I, I don't put you know put, put the flame that kind of thing. But it's like I, I feel like a judge in the X Factor. He thinks like Simon Cowell. He's good. <laughs> again with the, with the whole playing thing. No, it's like you know people have talent and have good ideas. I don't want to quash them, but. At the same time is that one collaboration is impossible because if I take their story and code it, you know, they're not going to like my, my, my rendition, if you will, because I can't code exactly what they were thinking at that moment in time. You know, Howard, you got it wrong. Well, you see it's computer code. We can't do anything we want at all, period. <clears throat> so I, I don't want to, to put anybody off. I will definitely look at offers or submissions where give me your idea or give me a synopsis and can you code because I can't do their work and my work too. And collaborating is going to be a nightmare. So I, I won't say no, I won't do it or no, everyone's turned out, but you got to put me an offer in writing or email if you'd rather, that's fine too. And do it professionally. You can Google the, t the topic and get a good structure going there. I'll look at it. I won't say no. But uh, I found experience, it, it does not usually go well. And I, I don't mean to put anybody down or, uh, you know, you know, put my thumb down in the dreams and squash them like bugs. But <laughs> it just, it, it's professionally a very, very difficult mountain to climb. Putting it that way. I mean, is it even possible for somebody that's, I mean, let's just say this person is just phenomenally talented. You, you look at their story, you think, man, this is this is right up there with the best of the Infocom stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah, is this person going to make a living with this? or I mean, what, what kind of expectations should they have about the, the sales? First, I'm going to springboard off what you just said. Scott Adams, brilliant author. I'm sure I was wondering if, we, if he was going to come up. <laughs> I've, I've um, had him on the show before. You kind of almost mentioned him, kind of, sort of. Scott Adams, Steve Bresky collaborated on, you know, their game. First picture I got the galaxy, and that was like pulling teeth out with a pair of pliers without anesthesia, because Scott Adam, you know, he was the perennial procrastinator, blew every deadline. In fact, you can Google it. There was all kinds of notes that came out a couple of years ago about how Steve fly to London, get his ass in a chair, and write this damn game because we're so behind schedule. And even when you have two brilliant minds. I'm sorry, Scott Adams. I'm sorry, Douglas Adams. Golly gee. She made up to the Douglas Adams. Look, 15 hours later, how are you guys going to do? Douglas Adams, pardon me. At least I caught myself anyway. When Douglas Adams was collaborating with Tiberski on first bureaucracy, I, I'll say first of all, uh, that almost didn't happen. And with, you know, he's got the galaxy. They blew every deadline. And then the next game, which never materialized, but you can download a little itty bitty version of it, which almost kind of got done, sort of. And I'll 
it's I, I got a bookmark somewhere. If you want to email me, I'll give you the link for it. It never happened. And they try to bring in a second writer and then a third author because collaboration is, is a disaster because are you free? Are they free? Where are they thinking? What are you thinking? They have an idea, but can you code the idea? And, and Douglas Adams is, was a brilliant writer. I mean, this man went before his time. If I could say, but any author at all that went too early, Douglas Adams, you know, dropped dead at a gym in California years ago, um, working out, trying to stay healthy, which is a, 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 an irony that he would of course savor like anybody else. Um, it, it was a failure. I mean, the, the games worked eventually, but the time, the effort, the manpower, the money, the time wasted was a burnt infocom. In fact, they were counting on the sequel to save the company, and and it ended up it didn't. It sank the company. So that that's what you're in collaboration. But back to your next question, which I already forgot about. Which so please run me again. I think that was the, so, you know, how much money could they expect to make? Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. Undisputed um, masterpiece of, you know, text adventure wonderment. Well, billions or, or beans. <laughs> no, no, really, I mean, that's the answer. When, when, you're, when you're selling books, you're the author reaching an audience of millions, but you're competing with thousands of other authors who are writing books, too. So the, the question I got all the time was, can we make a living doing this? Yes, if you can sell books to enough people, because I write books, interactive books, but they're books. So the challenge that any author has to make money is, how do I get enough people to find a book and then buy a copy? It's the same difference. It isn't like I'm, I'm, I'm a billionaire yet, God willing, one day, but it's like it's, it's a matter of marketing to your readers. Where are they? Who are they? How many can you get? How many can you keep? How many will buy your first book, and then your second book? So the money's been made. I mean, I'm not going to kid anybody. I mean, uh, the money is there. It's not a doubt at all. But it's the same entry. I'm sorry. The very entry is the same like today, like the Kindle bottle. You go to Amazon. You publish a book for two hundred and ninety a copy. It goes to Amazon Marketplace. You make your 70%. They get 30%. And then how many books can you sell? It's the same game, except that writing in fiction is like 45 times harder and takes 10 times longer. That's why it costs way, way more than a book at Amazon, because the costs are much higher. But it can be done. you know. So I encourage people, get out there. If you have a good idea and you can really do good coding and you can really do quality and do a good website with good e-commerce, it's doable. I mean, you can make... A great, great living doing this. Uh, Brian Lumley, uh, great horror author. I met him, I met him at uh, EerieCon up in Niagara Falls years ago. Uh, he's a great horror novelist, but he's not Stephen King. But here is what he said he calls success. My house is paid for. I got a great pool in the backyard. I get big checks every month, and I've got a care in the world. Rock on. You know, it's all relative. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, should be here next week, hopefully, with the review of Tales of Illyria. Uh, but I'm still waiting on a, a video adapter for my tablet, so if it doesn't come in, we'll have to do something else. But hopefully that's what will be on the agenda for next week. Uh, so a couple of news items. Uh, one is I got the matchhat.us site up now. Uh, this is a WordPress blog where I'll be keeping you posted. That's where I'll be uh, posting the uh, pod audio podcast I do as well as my a blog post about the industry and all my uh, various projects. So please go over there if you haven't already. Uh, the site is uh, still under development, so if you do have ideas for ways it could be improved, uh, please let me know. I'm very uh, open to your ideas with that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I will no longer be associated with the Armchair Arcade site. So even though uh, hopefully the uh, uh, editor there will continue to keep the Matt Chat link there for a while. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to last, so I try to make a mental note to go ahead and transition to the matchhat.us site. I greatly appreciate your uh, participation feedback there, as well as on Facebook and Twitter and uh, Google+. Okay, what else? Uh, Ale of the Week. All right, so for the ale this week, I have an India Pale Ale. Uh, Lufsta IPA from Star Coal. And uh, Christian actually sent in a nice little write up about it, which I thought I would read to you. A little story of the brewery. 
It says, this is the story of this brewery. Uh, my father grew up in the area around Lustabruck, and for more than 10 years and counting, the people there have been running a home brewing club called the Friends of the Lustael. Every other Sunday, they would brew 250 liters of wort, and as a member, you could buy a 20 liter bucket or two, store them to ferment and clarify, and then put it on tap or bottle. Some put it on bottles with added yeast and sugar to get the carbonation, but most use a keg and add carbon dioxide. When carbonated, you connect it to a draft tap or use a simple plastic tap to serve. Two years ago, they started a company for commercial brewing of ale and beer, Lustrabuch's uh, <laughs> Beer Bride Jerry uh, AB. In Sweden, as in Norway and Finland, all alcohol is sold by state controlled agencies and restaurants, border shops, and the like need the permission. Uh, so, to sell the brew, you must set up a company, get the permission, and only then are you allowed to sell the state alcohol uh, system Bolaget <laughs> and to uh, restaurants. Yes, it's kind of communistic. Uh, but on the flip side, System Bloget, System Bulligat, <laughs> you know, Christian's probably laughing his ass off at my pronunciations, uh, have a greater selection of beverages than just about any alcohol shops there is. Uh, anyway, Lufstrabuch's uh, Briggery AB have been producing ale for two years, with pretty much all the work being done in the spare time, involving anything from production, transportation, and deliveries. Uh, since I'm quite far away, I've only been able to help them out on a few occasions, but they have turned a decent profit and have been able to invest in additional equipment. Right now they are brewing in a thousand liter batches and have several tanks for fermentation and storage. Uh, so he sent me two different brews to try, uh, the IPA and I think the other one is uh, uh, just a regular pale ale, I believe. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, really fantastic. I'm really looking forward to getting this open and trying it out, so uh, let's make it happen. All right, so I'm here with some of this uh, Lufsta IPA here in the rather excellent drinking horn. After uh, reading Christian's story here, I'm ex very excited about trying this one. I've been smelling it. It smells very, very nice. It's got kind of a, a bit of a lemony, citrusy kind of a scent to it. You can definitely smell the hops in here, but it really is it's sort, of, sort of a citrusy aroma that's really uh, uh, is what you detect in the smell. But anyway, let's give it a, to uh, a taste. And uh, here's a toast to you, Christian. Thank you very much. <laughs> now this, uh, okay, it's definitely got a kick to it. Now these guys definitely aren't messing around with flavor. I mean, this is full flavor, getting a lot of uh, citrusy uh, kind of flavors here, a bit of the hoppiness, a little bit of bitterness. It's, it's nice and creamy. Um, Kind of that sort of little bit of a nutty taste that you get with these uh, IPAs. Uh, very, very nice. Just all around a really sophisticated taste. Um, you know, I always like an ale that you taste it and you're still sort of tasting different things even a minute or two after you take a swallow. I mean, that's a really, really uh, excellent brew there. Uh, definitely no question on this. It's going to be a full five out of five drinking horns on this. A very complex, very uh, tasty, lots of stuff going on with the taste buds. And not overpowering, uh, you know, it's not like the alcohol overpowers it or anything. You just get a lot of flavor with this. I really, really enjoy this. Uh, it's no, no wonder uh, Christian was so excited about it. Uh, thanks again. Excellent choice. Uh, this is Lufsta IPA in the Paleo. Unfortunately, it sounds like it's uh, quite hard to get a hold of, which is a, a real shame. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. So for the quotation this week, I asked Howard uh, for some input on this since he's such an avid reader. And he came up with this one from uh, Hana Rose Zadra, a Buddhist thinker. And it goes something like this. Reach for your dreams and they will reach for you. See you guys next week. Why do you think that you're having problem trying to solve this little puzzle? Here's why. Remember I said in the beginning, how big is this piece of paper? Yeah. That was to make you think of the dimensions of the paper. So that when I said you want to cut a hole big enough to jump through, your mind said, well, the dimensions of the paper are 8.5 by 11, therefore the hole can't be any bigger. Yeah. That's right. Not right. Not nope. right. You have to make the hole bigger than that, obviously. <laughs>